So in the Church Bible, it will be page 8 to 9, Ephesians 5, starting from verse 17 to 33. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife, as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Well, this morning we're in Ephesians chapter 5, a passage that has been read to us. And I've entitled the message this morning, The Power for Marriage. The power for marriage and what we're doing is we're kind of camping on these verses in Ephesians 5 and developing over a series of messages the teaching here on marriage and, and uh, I do so with some intrepidation, not the least the fact I'm a married man myself. But also I'm a very aware of the fact that uh, uh, <clears throat> not everyone in the congregation is in a married state, and so you may wonder what application this has for the whole congregation. Shouldn't we perhaps put these in a seminar and just invite married people to come at some other time on Sunday morning? I think one of the things that uh, is very apparent from this passage of Scripture is that Paul is speaking here about relationships generally, the marriage relationship being only one of many of the relationships that we enjoy in the body of Christ and outside of the body of Christ. And, and what he has to say here about marriage and about family and about slave and master really applies to all of our relationships. So with that encouragement to my own heart, I bring these series of messages, uh, understanding that each one of us here this morning is in relationship with someone else. So this morning, it's the power for marriage. The Lord never intended us to go alone in our marriages. He never intended to bring us together in marriage and then just leave us to figure it out for ourselves. This most important of relationships is one of the most difficult of relationships. And the Lord knows this, and so he has provided for our marriages. He's provided for our marriages basically in three ways. Through his word, the Bible, through his Holy Spirit, and through his people. His word, his spirit, and his people have been provided to help us with our marriages. The word gives us direction, guidance, and encouragement. The spirit provides the power to do what is not natural for us. And his people provide a sympathy of common experience. Now, I wonder, out of those three, I wonder 
which one of those three that you have tended to look to more for help in your marriage or indeed in any of your relationships? Well, perhaps we're most readily drawn to the Bible since it's a ready source of insight. Whereas the power of his spirit remains more of a mystery to us and uh, perhaps it's safer to be left alone. And as for talking to others about such a personal matter, that's a foreign idea to most of us. Well, this morning I'd like to talk briefly about the power of the Spirit that is available for our marriages. A power that enables our marriages and all our relationships to sing the songs of grace. You see, how can weak and sinful and frail and stumbling people like us find any power at all to make a marriage work that sings the songs of grace. We just don't have it within us, do we? It's the desire of our hearts, but so often we feel that in our marriage relationships, it doesn't even get close to that. Where does the power come from to enable our marriages to be marriages that proclaim the savour of Christ in ways that are inviting and draw people into a relationship made in heaven. Well, as we bring this question to our passage this morning, may the Lord grant us clarity, joy, and hope. So looking again in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now here is where Paul begins his teaching on relationships. And you'll appreciate that here in in the book of Ephesians, while he begins with a marriage relationship, he has other relationships in mind. So as he begins to think about human relationships, this is where he begins. He begins with a command that we be filled with the Spirit. You see, the teaching on marriage does not begin in verse 22, it begins in verse 17. Now, Paul wants us to be filled with the Spirit, and the reason is that the Spirit fills us with the truth of Christ. The Spirit fills us with the peace of Christ, with the word of Christ, with the life of Christ, with the fruit of Christ, with the joy of Christ. The Holy Spirit fills us with Christ. Being filled with the Spirit is all about being filled with Jesus Christ for all our relationships. The marriage relationship, the parent-child relationship, the slave-master relationship, Jesus Christ is central to all our relationships. Now, Devold read for us this morning verses 17 to 33. There are 16 verses there in the passage that he read, and out of those 16 verses, 13 of those 16 refer to Jesus Christ. So you thought it was a passage about marriage. (laughs) <laughs> it's actually a passage about Jesus Christ. Well, why wouldn't it be? If we're going to be talking about Christian marriage, then let's talk about Jesus. Because without Jesus, there is no Christian marriage. Without Jesus, there is no marriage that will glorify God and his saving grace. This passage is all about Jesus. So he begins in verse 17 and 18 saying, be filled with the Spirit, and then he goes on to talk about Jesus, 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 for 13 of those 16 verses. Because you see, if we are full of the Holy Spirit, which is none other than the Spirit of Christ, then our marriages will be full of Jesus. Jesus will be central to the marriage relationship. So we can't talk about any aspect of that relationship without talking about Jesus Christ, without talking about what it means to be continually filled up with the Spirit of Christ, because here is the power for making a marriage that sings. You see, the picture we have here of marriage is not that of two needy people 
unsure of their own value and purpose, simply settling for living out their God-given roles. Couples who settle for this kind of relationship can appear to have marriages that are settled and conflict-free for many years, but when the time comes for the wedding anniversary photo, the kiss will be forced and unnatural. This passage rather assumes that each person who comes to marriage has already settled the two big questions of life. Who they are in Christ, greatly loved, saved and forgiven. And the second great question of life, what is your purpose for being in Christ? To offer themselves to others because Christ is their first love. The two people filled with the Spirit of Christ come together in marriage knowing that they are firstly greatly loved, saved and forgiven by Jesus Christ. So immediately they're not looking to the other to do what only Christ can do because they're already living in the experience of what Christ can do. And secondly, as they come together in marriage, it's to offer themselves to the other, not because that's the only way to get their needs met, but they offer themselves to the other because Jesus Christ is their first love. He is the one who occupies centre place in their hearts and lives. And it's out of that, the power of the indwelling Christ, that they love and offer themselves to the other. Rather than running for years empty on spiritual fumes, they each know where the fuel station is and how to access spiritual fuel for their souls. So Paul talking to spirit-filled people, is ready to talk about their relationships. Having settled for us, his readers, that to talk about marriage, we must first talk about being spirit-filled people. Having settled that, then the first word off the rank is a word about submission. Verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He's talking to spirit-filled people, and he says to spirit-filled people, here is my first word about all that I'm to say about relationships. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Spirit-filled people are to be in submission to one another because their first submission is to Christ whose spirit fills them. Now, someone, some uh, bloke may say to me after the service, and uh, this is a statement I've heard a number of times, he may say to me, but Peter, there's nowhere in that passage that says that husbands are to be in submission to their wives. Well, it's true. It doesn't say that. But also note that nowhere in that passage does it say that wives should love their husbands. <laughs> Oops. But you see, a marriage in which wives do not love their husbands would be a barren marriage indeed. And a marriage in which husbands do not yield at times to the superior wisdom of their spirit-filled wives would be a harsh marriage indeed. So on what basis then are wives to love their husbands since it's not here in the passage? And on what basis should husbands listen to the wisdom of their wives since it's not here in the passage? The answer is Jesus Christ. We come back to Jesus Christ. That's ultimately where these questions and these differences find their resolution. And that one common factor between both, Jesus Christ. Because you see, wives that are filled with the Spirit are women who are filled with the love of Christ. And this love they naturally and continually offer to others, especially their husbands with whom they have the closest of relationships. And husbands who are filled with the Spirit a men who are filled with the gentle strength of Christ, for whom it is second nature to listen carefully to the opinions of others before deciding and leading, especially to their wives who know them better than anyone else. Spirit-filled husbands will insist on their wives' counsel. Well, that's not, what all, that's not all that Paul says about submission. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Verse 24. 
Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Notice in those two verses, we have those two little phrases, as to the Lord in verse 22 and as to Christ in verse 24. A spirit-filled submission is a submission that is qualified by as to the Lord and as to Christ, who is your first love. So you're not bound, you see. Wives are not bound to submit to anything that is contrary to Jesus Christ and his demands for their holiness. They're not bound to agree or go along with any sinful practice. See, that helps us with those little words at the end of verse 24, in everything. This is not a blank check for husbands. The church does submit to Christ in everything because Jesus would require nothing of us that would dishonor the name of his Father. But husbands are not as Christ in the marriage relationship. Wives are to submit only to Christ-honoring requirements, and sometimes submission means saying no with a quiet and gentle spirit. Well, what is the great enemy of a spirit-filled marriage? What is the great enemy that drains away the power of marriage? The besetting sin of every relationship and especially the marriage relationship, is self-centeredness. The elevation of self and all that self demands. Self-centeredness is the antithesis of the spirit-filled life. The spirit-filled life has Christ at the center. A life that is not spirit-filled has self at the center. Those are the only two options. Either Christ is at the center or self is at the center. Now that's why Paul says be continually filled with the Spirit because he knows that continually self is seeking to be central in all our relationships. And the only way that we can knock self out of the center of our relationships is if Jesus Christ is central. The only antidote to self-centeredness is Christ-centered. It is not trying harder to do a better job of loving and being considerate but it's repenting of the sin of self-centeredness and seeking only to be filled with the forgiving love of Christ. The self-deception of sin means that we are often blind to our own self-centeredness, but very aware of our spouse's self-centeredness. The result is a downward spiral into self-pity. Anger and despair as the relationship gets eaten away to nothing because self is central. The answer is not to replace self with a spouse. The answer is not to say, well, if self can't be at the centre, then my spouse must be at the centre, but rather to replace self-centeredness with Christ-centeredness. In spirit-filled people, Jesus Christ is central. Let me just give you another verse on that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse uh, fifteen. Second Corinthians five fifteen, talking about Jesus Christ, and He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. But he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Jesus died for us because he put us in the center of his affections. It was Jesus' love for us that took him to the cross. And that verse tells us that to live as spirit-filled people requires that we put him at the center of our affections. That we die to Christ and see ourselves, as it were, nailed to the cross with him, with ourself and all its demands. 
Or again in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Our old self was crucified with him, that we should no longer be slaves to self. Here is the power for marriage. Here is the power that sets our marriages free from self-centeredness. You see, something in us must die. And what must die is a commitment to self and having the needs of self met. Now, you think about your marriage relationship. How often your response to your spouse comes out of the sense of what you want. What would make you happy? What would fulfill your needs? What will enable you to accomplish the God-given ministry that God has given you, O great man of God? You see, and out of that comes a demand to spouse, which uh, is really only designed to meet the needs of self. Well, Romans 6 says self must die on the cross. So your spouse can turn to you and say, hmm, something has crawled down off the cross that needs to be nailed back up there. See, the problem with the living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. You see, and, and self must keep crawling back up there. So in the morning before you get out of bed, imagine your bed is an altar and you, you lie there in bed and you say, today self is going to be sacrificed on this altar. And because it's a living sacrifice, you have to get out of bed. <laughs> see, so you get out of bed and start your day. You can't say, I'm a sacrifice today, so I'm going to stay in bed and pretend to be dead. It's a living sacrifice that keeps crawling off the altar and must keep crawling back. And why does it crawl back? Because self has been crucified. That's the power of the indwelling Christ by his spirit that enables us day by day by day to sacrifice self because Jesus Christ in his central position in our lives fulfills all the needs and desires of our heart as we turn to him in praise and worship. When Jesus is at the center of our hearts, we offer ourselves first to him and then we offer ourselves to others because of our joy and happiness we have in him. We die to self. Now, if both spouses decide at the same time to repent of self-centeredness and trust Christ for their needs and begin offering themselves to one another on that basis, the prospect for their marriage indeed is wonderful. But if only one spouse decides on this course of action it will still make the marriage definitely better for both. And that one spouse who does decide on this course of action will experience the joy of living with Christ at the center of their hearts. This problem of self-centeredness in a close relationship like marriage has occupied the thoughts and attentions of many people, not just Christians. In the secular view of this problem of self-centeredness goes something like this. Self-protection and self-realization must be the goal in your relationship with this other person. Your spouse or your partner must come to see that their role is to assist you to reach your full potential. And if they don't do a good enough job, then find someone who will. So self is cemented in place as central. Now, the conservative Christian approach to this problem of self-centeredness in marriage goes something like this. There will be no problem if both husband and wife commit to their God-given role in marriage. The husband needs to act as head of the family and the wife must submit to his headship. What's the problem with that? What's the problem with that mechanistic, formulaic, view of the marriage relationship. The problem is what is left out of that formula, namely Jesus Christ. You see, from verses 17 to 33, 13 of those 16 verses refer to Jesus Christ. That conservative Christian formula for marriage leaves Jesus Christ out of the picture, and all it leaves you with is trying harder to fulfill a role which you constantly fail to fulfill anyway, 
and it just leaves you feeling guilty for the state of your marriage. The problem of self-centeredness cannot be dealt with by trying harder to fulfill the roles without Jesus Christ being central. The problem of self-centeredness can only be dealt with by Christ and his gospel. Another way of saying that, the only way to deal with self-centeredness is by repentance towards Christ, not by trying harder to do a better job of fulfilling the roles. Not by trying harder to fulfill a role or expectation. There is no power in trying harder. Trying harder only puts self in the center. If Jesus is not central, then his gospel is not central to our day-to-day relating. And if his gospel is not central, then headship and submission will be from hearts empty of grace and empty of spirit enabling power it will be a drudgery so we must put the focus where this passage puts the focus that the power of a god honoring marriage is not so much dependent on getting the role sorted out but on two hearts coming together filled with the holy spirit and his fruits two hearts that preach the gospel to themselves every day Each heart reminds themselves every day that Jesus Christ has amassed a perfect record for me. By my faith in him, he has given that record to me and he has lived the life that I should have lived and in my place he has died the death that I deserve to die and when I believe in him and his sacrifice, my sins are pardoned. I am counted righteous in his sight and filled with his Holy Spirit every day. That's how we should see ourselves in that light, and that's how we should see our spouse in that light. So in the morning at breakfast time, you're sitting at the breakfast table and there's your spouse, your wife or husband, and as you look across at them, you say something like this in your heart. I am looking at a person for whom Jesus Christ has amassed a perfect record. I am looking at a person who has put their faith in Christ and he has given that perfect record to them. I am looking at someone for whom Jesus Christ has lived the life that they should live and has died the death that they deserve to die. I'm looking at someone whose sins have been pardoned because they believe in Jesus Christ. I am looking at someone who is counted righteous in his sight this very moment. I'm looking at someone who is filled with his Holy Spirit this very moment. Be a great breakfast, won't it? And as soon as you acknowledge that to yourself, where does your heart go then? Lord, I am sorry that I have not consistently related to my spouse on that basis. Please forgive me for the ways I've sinned against my spouse by not relating to them on that basis. And today, please fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can relate to them as one who is a precious, forgiven and righteous child in your sight. Hey, there's power in the gospel. There's power to change your heart. There's power to change my old stubborn heart. And to break me down. And to break each one of us down. So that when our hearts are broken open by the power of the gospel, what is released is the fragrance of grace and love. So that our spouse knows they're richly and deeply loved because Jesus is central in their spouse's heart. We have been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And our hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Here's the power of a Spirit-filled life. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Has the love of God been poured into your heart? Is this is what Is this what your heart is filled with every day, the love of God? If so, then you see, we love because he first loved us. So when our spouse wrongs us, our response in our hearts goes something like this. I will gladly forgive him or her because Jesus has fully forgiven me. When our spouse misunderstands me, I will continue to love him or her because Jesus fully understands me. 
when our spouse rebukes us unjustly or harshly, I can bear with this and continue to love because Jesus has covered all my sins. When our spouse withholds their love from us, I will continue to love because Jesus loves me utterly. When our spouse, you fill it in. You know your marriage is better than I do. When your spouse, whatever it is, your response is, I will gladly continue to love because Jesus has, and you fill it in, you see? Whatever it is, because of Jesus, you can continue to love and offer yourself because self has died on the cross with him. You see, our marriages are all about Jesus. Here is the power of marriage, and indeed for any and every relationship. It is the power of the gospel to change our lives as we are filled daily with his Holy Spirit and put self to death. This week, ask the person closest to you, where have you experienced my self-centeredness in our relationship? Really? <laughs> you really want me to ask that? Well, it's up to you, really. The person you're closest to, single or married, where have you experienced my self-centeredness in our relationship? That our marriages and all our relationships will love and sing and wonder and praise the Saviour's name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that what is most important to you is made most clear in your scripture. And Father, we know, each one of us, including myself, as, as we examine these scriptures, that each one of us have fallen far short of being uh, filled with Christ in our relationships. Lord, we pray you would humble us this morning. You'd bring us to that point of confession and repentance before you. Father, you'd begin to teach us what it means to put self to death, to be that living sacrifice, so that we can live others, love others with a heart in which Jesus Christ has poured his grace and his love into us, and out of that we gladly love. We ask these things for the glory of his name. Amen.